you open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. I think maybe to clarify Pastor Daniel's story about the toe, it, it wasn't one of our kids. Let's, how about that? Is that? And I don't think it was any of the other campers either. So just, just so you know that you're not worried the whole sermon. Like, oh, I lost a toe. Well, not ours, not ours, so don't worry. But uh, Matthew chapter 5, we're looking specifically at 17 and 18 as we get started today, although we're going to be jumping all over the place. But we're continuing our series as we look at and understand our statement of faith and consider that. And today is the enduring word. And it's not often that someone can say that this item, this device, this concept, this idea will change your life. Even less common is when someone comes up and says, this will change the world. But there have been a few moments in time where things like that have happened. And I think of nuclear energy as one of those kinds of things. When Marie Curie kind of came up with and started discovering this, and she would have had no idea what her, these concepts that she was discovering and, and figuring out, the way in which it would affect the world. And today, when you think of nuclear energy, sometimes we're focused more on like the atomic bombs and we look at the destructive power of nuclear energy, but we also think about all the, the, the positive things, whether it's nuclear medicine or whether it's the, the energy that comes from our homes. There's a lot of things that revolve around those ideas. And so nuclear energy didn't just change a person's life, it literally changed the world. Communication would be another one. The way in which we can communicate in the day and age in which we live is just mind-boggling. And you think about even just 100 years ago to tell someone, say, hey, you know what? One day, you're going to be able to carry a device in your pocket, and you're going to be able to come up on, call someone, and not just talk to them in virtually real time, but see them as you're talking to them. I mean, that's the stuff they would have looked at you and thought, you're just, you're crazy. That's not possible. And 100 years ago, it really wasn't. But for that kind of communication, we take for granted that we can do relatively cheaply and effectively and instantly and whenever we want to. That didn't, that wasn't just life changing. That was world changing. Because what happens with the ability to communicate, not just in that way, but massive amounts of information between continents, has allowed progress and innovation and, and concepts and ideas to go back and forth between the, around the globe. And people have heard of other ideas so much quicker and say, hey, I know what I can do with that. And they build on it, and they build on it, and it changes. The communication is really one of those things that we don't really think about, even though we do it all the time. And yet it is truly world changing. But I think another thing that we have to put in that category is the Bible itself. And you might think, well, I mean, sure, the Bible will change your life. And you heard the testimony of the kids of, of seeing that taking place the world over. Absolutely. But you might not appreciate the way that the Bible has not just changed individual lives, but literally the world. The Christian uh, world, the, I shouldn't say the Christian world, the, the West has been influenced by Christianity at a level that we are so used to and familiar with that we don't understand all of those kinds of things, but it literally transforms cultures and peoples in ways that nothing else ever has. And for as much pe as people sometimes decry Christianity today the world over, the West's very existence, its prosperity, and values are all a direct result of it. Yet why is something that's so transformational so often viewed so, with so much contempt? That's a great question. And I think part of that goes down to, can we really trust the Bible? Can we really trust that what we have in front of us is actually what God has given to us? We, we talked a little about inerrancy last week, about what God wrote and how he communicated his word, that what we have is actually what God said. But what about preservation? Because really what goes hand in hand with inspiration and inerrancy is preservation. What good is it really if God has given us his word if he doesn't preserve it? That we know that today we have a Bible that's the same as what they would have had, I don't know, 100 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or Jesus' Bible. Is it different? Is it the same? We need the concept and the idea of preservation. Right? And many people think that maybe perhaps this has been manipulated, that it's been changed over the course of years. And maybe because of that, we can't necessarily trust it. Has the Bible been developed in some way to control people, to make them easier targets, to make them uh, happier and mindless? Karl Marx thought so. He was famous for saying that it's an opiate of the people so that they don't have to deal with reality. And there are many people that would say and agree with that. Yes, it's an opiate. It's just a distraction to keep people from focusing on the real thing. But then you have other people. Still atheist people. But atheist social psychologist Jonathan Haidt observed Surveys have long shown that religious believers in the United States are happier, healthier, 
longer lived, and more generous to charity and to each other than secular people. Religious believers give more money than secular folk to secular charities and to their neighbors. They give more of their time, too, and of their blood. So yeah, it's good. Our Christianity is good. But is it what God initially intended? Or has it been changed? For whatever reason. Has it been changed? After all, Bernie Madoff made a lot of people very wealthy until he, people realized he actually made people very poor. How do you know that what you have in your hands today is actually what God said? That somebody hasn't played with it, somebody hasn't manipulated it. Sure, you live longer and you're a little bit happier, but if it's all a lie, what benefit is there really to it? It's a great question. And this comes up because of our statement of faith right here concerning the scriptures. We believe that the Holy Bible was written in errant in its original languages. That part is very important. It is inerrant in its original languages by men divinely inspired and is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction that has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter, that it reveals the principles by which God will judge us and therefore is and shall remain to the end of the age the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions shall be tried. So we understand that God has promised to preserve his word and history and really the Bible both show us and tell us that he has. Last week we looked at scripture specifically and pondered what it is, why we need it, and what do we do with it. This week we're simply asking the question and trying to answer the question, can we trust it? And we look at those assurances, look at those assurances within and assurances without. So we start with assurances within. Jesus said that not even a jot or a tittle would pass away from the law until all was fulfilled. That's the language of the authorized version of the King James Version. You have it there in front of you here in the ESV. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not in a yoda, not a dot, will pass from the law until, it is, uh, until all is accomplished. What does he mean by that? Well, here behind me, you see some of the letters that he's actually talking about, or, or I shouldn't even say letters because they're barely that. The, the jot or the yod on your, it's my left, I think it's still, yep, your left, uh, mirror images here. Uh, but you see that a little bit. There. It's the smallest really letter in Hebrew that there was. And then when it talks about the tittle, it's literally talking about that stroke. So you see the little, the circle there, it's just talking about that little bump out on the side. I think in modern context, it would be the difference between Times New Roman and Arial, if you're familiar with serif and, not, and sans serif fonts if that helps you a little bit. It's just the little strokes, the little edges on the letters that distinguish, in Hebrew especially, the differences between certain letters sometimes. They're small. They're relatively insignificant in the grand scheme of things. And so what Jesus meant when he came was not that, um, was that he was coming not to change the law. He was not coming to change it. He wasn't coming to rewrite the things that they had. He was there to fulfill it. He looked and saw and claimed the Old Testament was authoritative as it stood. It's important. He looked at that as authoritative as it stood and went so far as to say that every aspect of the Old Testament would be fulfilled that way. And yet Jesus is also using hyperbole. He's using a little bit of exaggeration, if you will. And we do something very similar today when we talk about someone, hey, make sure you cross your T's and dot your I's. Why? Why, do we say, why is that so important? If you see a T in a letter that's not crossed, your mind automatically knows what that is. You fill it all, they just, you know, they forgot one, they missed one. Or a, a dot on an eye. And granted, sometimes that's hard to tell. But you can figure it out. You can say, okay, that, that eye needs a dot. Or they missed one, they forgot one. Or the pen didn't work when they dotted their eye. But it's inconsequential. We know what it means. And Jesus understood that too. All right? Can we really say that not one stroke of the Old Testament or the Bible has disappeared? Can we actually say that? Not at all. In fact, a lot have been lost. In fact, in seminary, uh, and this was a joke, but it was real. When we were doing that, sometimes, you don't know what an overhead projector is? I'm so dating myself right now, it's not even funny. But that used to be a thing. That, that was technology for you. Um, but we had some in the back room there for the longest time. And Pastor Love and I never used them. But there were these devices that had a light bulb underneath. You put something on top, it would reflect it onto the, the screen or something behind you. They're great fun. You could write on them and do things. We had those sometimes in seminary. And the joke was that sometimes if they were giving a quiz or a test and they would put a, uh, a page of Hebrew text that they wanted us to translate on there, if the screen was dirty, we might mistranslate it. 
Because all the little, the little, the jots and the tittles and the dots and the lines and the scratches that are part of the Hebrew language that are vowel pointing or some of the smallest letters, if there was a smudge on the screen and things happened to line up, you could literally translate heresy because that's what's on the screen. Or you would have a word, uh, the tense of the word would change, or the, the phrase or the name could change. Like sometimes very small changes. And it was really just because the screen was dirty. They're so small, they're so inconsequential. In, and, and when you look at it, it's just a line. And yet that could be the difference between one letter and another. And you understand how some of that could happen. Just be due to smudging or something like that. And so when our, our statement of faith talks about we believe that the, the, uh, the, uh, the scripture is inerrant and inspired in its original languages, in its original form, what we mean by that is the autographs, the actual writing, so that when Peter was finished writing his book or Paul was finished writing his book, that book is inspired and inerrant as it stands. But you understand that copies are copies. The things happen. How many of you have ever been writing down even something as simple as a recipe and wrote the wrong thing down? Teaspoons versus tablespoons. Have you ever gotten those confused? It's not that hard to do. And imagine writing a context in which there's not even space in between words. Would you miss something? Would you miscopy something? It happens all the time. Plus, given over the, time, uh, over the course of time, other things happen to those texts as well. But in Luke's parallel to this passage, he says in Luke 16, 17, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. What does he mean by that? He says, even if you take this whole book, this whole Bible, so to speak, and you destroy it, what you cannot do is make null and void the word of God. It will come to pass. That you cannot simply come down here with a pen and rewrite what God has said in effect to actually have any sizable sense of change. Or that you can actually change with your own willpower, your own determination, or with your own army, the things that God has declared. You can't do it. What God has declared, He has determined, and He will fulfill. You cannot change it. You cannot alter it. The Word of God is sure. Absolutely sure. Jesus didn't come to change it. You cannot alter it. All of it will come to pass. All of it will be fulfilled as it stands. What Jesus is ultimately saying is it would be easier for the sky to fall than for the word of God to fail. That's how Jesus saw the Bible. And one of the promises was that God would preserve his word. I will preserve my word. We looked at that briefly a little bit last week in John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He's promising here that the Spirit will come alongside them and, and help them to remember. I mean, they spent years with Jesus, but there's also been years in between that. You tend to forget things. You tend to miss things. Or what's really important? And he says the Holy Spirit will come alongside of you and help you and remember the things as they happened and as they were so that you can write this down and it will be what God wants it to be. It will be the word of God and it will stand the test of time and we will have that recorded for us so that we could know this and have this. But the Spirit will come and help you remember. Because it's hard to remember everything that happens over the course of three years. And what do you include and what do you not include? I mean, the disciples have seen all kinds of miracles. They've heard all kinds of teaching. They've heard, they've seen, they've been, they've done. They've done a lot of kind of things like that. But this guy, he says the Spirit will come and help you and instruct you. There's one way that God said, I will preserve my word. The Spirit will help you remember. You will write it down. And others will copy it. And then there's also Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purify it seven times. You, O oh Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. God's words are pure, and he will keep them. He'll keep them. He'll keep them. That's important. And that actually brings up a good point. When we talk about this inspiration, what good is inspiration if there's no preservation? If things would erode. Things would fall apart. If God, if God gives us his word but makes no effort or promise to preserve his word, how do we know that we actually still have his word? Or has it been lost? You would never have any assurance that you're reading the real thing, the right thing. God actually promises not only to give his word, but to preserve his word to us. And one of the ways he's done it is through the sheer volume of manuscripts that we have. And it's hard for us to calculate and comprehend how much material that really is when it comes to the word of God. And we can see and fathom this a little bit. It's been illustrated a few times, but 
and just talking about the New Testament, not the Old Testament, just the New Testament, if you were to compile all the New Testament manuscripts together and pile them on top of each other, stack them on top of each other, it would be as high as four and a half empire state buildings, including the antenna on top. You think about that, four and a half empire state buildings. It's, it's like five, 6,000 feet, 5,600 feet, something like that. It's massive. It's like 21,000 manuscripts. It's, it's a huge pile. And it's not just Greek. It's, there's some Greek and, and Latin and some Coptic and some other ones. But you're talking about ancient manuscripts that were used, or at least could be used, when translating the New Testament. And that's only the New Testament that we're talking about. It's a massive amount of documentation that, it, that attests to the whole the word of God, specifically the New Testament. And you think, well that's that's a lot, but it's not like the Bible was the only book in existence at that moment in time, which is true. So what's the second most attested book? Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is the second most attested book. The New Testament has about twenty one thousand manuscripts attesting to it. The Homer's Iliad has about two thousand. You think about how much less that actually is. And what's also interesting is that the earliest ones are 400 years after the original. So there's a huge gap from when the original was written to when the, cop, the oldest copy of Homer's Iliad we have. The New Testament, many of those copies are within 30 years of the original. There's a lot less time for things to corrupt, a lot less time for things to fall out of place. And it's truly remarkable when you think about the sheer volume of work that's out there that attests to the authenticity and the reality of the New Testament. Nothing else even comes close. And so when we talk about God and inerrancy and God preserving his word, we really do mean that, that every jot and tittle was preserved from the slip of a pen to the bite of a, of, a, of a worm or a bug or anything else like that in the sense that we know what God says. Right? We know what God says, but when they find, and I'll show you some manuscripts later of the Old Testament in a, little bit, in a little bit from now, but you'll see the way in which some of these, have, these manuscripts have been discovered. They're literally falling apart. They're literally full of holes. There's words missing. There's sentences missing. There's chapters missing. What about those? But when you look at all of them together, and you read them, and one fills in the holes from the other, and so on and so forth, we can be very assured that God has preserved his word. We know what he says. We know what he says. Are there spelling differences? Yes. Is there sometimes where a word gets left out? Yes, because people make mistakes when they copy things. And yet, when we look at manuscript after manuscript after manuscript, we can look at all this and go, well, I know what it's supposed to say there. I know what happened there. That, that, that silverfish ate that piece of paper. We know what's supposed to be in there. We can figure it out. We have confidence in, in the word of God that what we see here is, is, is actually what's supposed to be here. And so we, with great confidence, can say, yes, God has preserved his word for us. And we don't have to worry about it. There is no doctrine that is, comes into question or even comes close into question based on some kind of manuscript error or mistake or, or question. Or none of it. None of it. None of it comes, comes into question. We are sure of our doctrine. We are sure of the people and the, and the places in the Bible. And so the Bible also claims that it is the preserved word of God. So it's not just that we see these bits and pieces, but the claim itself means something. I think, well, isn't that what we've just been talking about? That, you know, it says that we've looked at verses. Well, that's true. However, we're not looking at external resources. We're looking at the Bible itself. The Bible itself is claiming to be the preserved word of God. And most people don't say that about the, the things that they write. Most books don't claim that for themselves. Why not? Well, one, it feels like you're, you know, if you're trying to define a word and then you use the word in the sentence that you're trying to define to define the word, you know, that's usually, like, my mom is right there. She would tell us, she like, well, you cannot use that. She's the big English grammar major. She will not let us get away with that. But neither would our teachers, right? You understand that you can't use the word that you're trying to define in the definition. It doesn't work. That's what you're trying to explain without that word. And it's kind of like, well, if, if the Bible is defending itself and saying, you can trust me, I, I, I'm trustworthy, it's like, it feels like you're using the, the, the word to define itself. Isn't that what we're doing with the Bible? Well, in a way, yes. But it's also interesting to know that it's a claim the Bible makes of itself. Most people aren't so bold. If I were to write a book or you were to write a book, you probably wouldn't make that claim. For one, you would know better. It's like, well, odds are there are probably plenty of mistakes in this book. I'm not going to do that. Plus, you invite scrutiny. As soon as you make that claim, everybody's like, oh, yeah, watch me find something. And we start going through that. How, what can I find? What can I find? What can I find? The Bible makes that claim, and it's not worried about it. 
It's not worried about it. And people have tried very, very hard to investigate the Bible and, and try to, to, to see things. And yet what we find here is Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Don't add to his word, because you'll be the liar. Don't mess with it. But his word proves true. And that is given as a comfort there in Proverbs, but it's also given as a challenge. And there's been many people that have picked up that, that challenge and said, let me try to disprove the Bible. The Bible's actually made converts out of a lot of them. Not all of them. But I think it's important for us to understand that you know, the Bible does not shy away from saying, you know what, don't question me. The Bible actually never says that. It tells us to trust him, but, but when people go into this and actually say, well, let me try and find and pick it apart, the Bible's not afraid of that. It's not afraid that, well, you'll, you'll, you'll look in the back. You'll, you'll find that one spot. It's not worried about that. Question the Bible. Go ahead. I'm encouraging. Question the Bible. In fact, the Apostle Paul was commending the, the, the Bereans for doing that very thing. When he would say things, they would go back through and they would check him on it. They would question him on, call him out on kinds of things. They wanted to see and verify. The Bible's not afraid of you doing that. Go ahead. and Check it out. Verify it. We're not hiding anything. Go ahead. Look at your Bible. Take the time to pick it apart and look at it and discover things. Many people have done that. Many people have tried. And what they found over and over and over again is the Bible is a faithful word of God. Something that you can leave from this room and have confidence in. That not only is this truly the inspired and inerrant word of God that you can build your life on, but it's not been changed from what God originally said either. This is foundational for your life. And it was given that way on purpose. It was designed that way on purpose, like to have and to enjoy this. So we look at these aspects of this, and we see internally the Bible supports, like this is the word of God. It really is the word of God, that you can trust this. And it waylays some of our fears that it is inaccurate in some capacity. It is accurate. But what about external proofs? What about things outside of the Bible? Let's, let's try to get away from defining something with using the very word in the sentence. And let's get outside of that. What else can we find? What else can we see? Can we find things outside of the Bible that also would support its claims? And in reality, we can. Here are a few of those. We can find some assurances from without. We have behind me, here is a picture of, uh, of the caves of Qumran, if you're familiar, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so, you honestly can't have a conversation about inerrancy and preservation of, of God's word without talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls in some capacity. And this happens to be um, Cave 4 in Qumran. I don't know if it's hard to see, but it's, there's, there's some blacker, darker spots towards the top over there that are some of the caves that were, were part of that. And that is, that is what this is. And how, how many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you are familiar at all with the Dead Sea Scrolls? Even if it's just the name, you've heard the Dead Sea Scrolls. All right, so not all of you then. Okay, okay. So this is, this is a fascinating story. And as the story is told, there were some shepherds. This is, I think, 1947, I think, is when the first one was discovered. But the story was a shepherd boy was out there looking for his, his flock. He was missing a goat. He was going around in the wilderness in this area looking for his goat. And rather than climbing all the way up there, he was taking stones and just throwing them in to these caves, probably hoping to startle the goat or whatever might be hiding in there rather than climbing all up there. And he throws one particular stone and he hears what sounds like the breaking of pottery. Oh, well, that's weird. And he's too afraid to climb up there and go in there and by himself because remember, this is 1947. It's not like he could just pull out his phone and turn on his flashlight and just start shining around. It's dark in there and it's, you know, it's, it, it's up high in there and who knows what's hiding in there. Like he doesn't know what's going on, but his curiosity has been piqued. And so a couple days later, he comes back with his cousin, and they decide to investigate. And they crawl in there cautiously and begin exploring this cave. I don't know if they had a light with them or not. I kind of doubt they did. I think they might have been just kind of feeling around and letting their eyes adjust to try to see what it was that they could see. And inside, they found several tall pottery jars with lids on them. And when they opened one, the stench of what was contained inside just kind of filled the cave, as they said. And they felt inside, and what they were feeling was a... Uh, a piece of linen just covered in pitch, probably make it as, as waterproof and bugproof as they possibly could inside this jar. And the pitch is what they were smelling along with just ancient old, just the smell of old. 
and, and they could smell it and they pull it out. And what they had were, were these, these uh, leather scrolls inside of these pitch covered linen wrappings inside these jars. And, and they pulled them out and, and, and see what was going on in there. And they realized they had these ancient scrolls. And at the time, they didn't know what they were. They had no idea what they were holding. But they were extremely brittle from age, but otherwise in relatively good condition because of the way in which they were kept. Altogether, the boys retrieved about seven scrolls from that cave. And, and incredible. You think about how, how long it's been in there, like how valuable that actually was. One of them was a complete scroll of the book of Isaiah, the all 66 books, 23 and a half feet long. It tells you how big this scroll was. Um, also, a less complete copy and a couple commentaries on the book of Genesis and the book of Habakkuk. Well, a couple of years go by before people start, the, the people in authority and antiquities and things start realizing like something is, somebody found something. We want to know where and what it is and everything else. About 1949, finally, some scholars learned about the, the location of the first cave and they explored. They also found about 72 other uh, fragments, not scrolls, but fragments of skulls, skulls, scrolls, there we go, and, uh, and realized that some of those fragments actually matched up like puzzle pieces with some of the scrolls that they had found and realized like this story is true like somebody they're not making this up we're pretending like everything's fitting together here and they were able to confirm a lot of this, the, the the account of these little boys that were there very important they were able to do that and this happens to be one of the jars in which they found some of these scrolls on uh and, and then the vessels and they found many more and in fact they found over uh, two dozen caves with jars like this not every jar had scrolls in it but some of them did they also found in a town nearby they actually found a kiln in which they think some of these jars were actually made so the community that was living there at the time were making these and they found and felt that the word of god and commentaries on the word of god were so precious that they never wanted them to be lost that they stored them like this and were hiding them like this so that they would never be lost it's truly remarkable what they found and everybody's confirmed that like, the, these scrolls really are, this is the, the, the time frame. This is not something more modern. They did carbon-14 testing on the wrappings of the scrolls and the scrolls themselves, both in 1951 and 1961, and realized they came from the Second Temple period. Second Temple is uh, not Solomon's Temple, but ultimately Herod's Temple. It's a temple that was started being built about 515 or so when the, when the Israelites returned from captivity. Right? And so you have Ezra and Nehemiah and all those guys coming into that from that, that from that time, 515 to about 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the temple. He said, that's when these scrolls are from. They're roughly 2,000 years old. The best preserved scroll, of course, is that Isaiah scroll. But what's the point of all this? Why does that matter? In fact, before I get too far ahead, this is, this is I just found this out looking at this. This is, color one is actually from, they just found another one. 2021, they found another cave. It's called the Cave of Horrors, if you want to look it up. I was not aware of this. And the reason they call it that was because they found 40 skeletons inside. But, um, but so that's why it has that name. But they also found bits and pieces of some more scrolls. But the benefit of all this is this, that they were able to compare the scrolls that were used actually to translate the Bible that's in your lap right now. All those scrolls are from about 900 A.D., after Christ. That's how old they were. It's old, 1,000 years old or so. But the Dead Sea Scrolls were about 1,000 years older. And that allows them, and, and kept in isolation. What, did, what does that do? It allows them to compare and contrast. How much has changed in 1,000 years? And both liberal and conservative scholars looked and said, you know what? Really not much. They're virtually identical. You know, you're going to have a misspelling here or a bug bite here. You'd expect that. But they're virtually unchanged. So when we talk about God preserving his word, we see it. And I think 1947 is very significant. Why were the caves discovered then? Well, that's true. Israel became, yeah, there was freedom for that, too. That, that I wasn't thinking of that part. Israel becomes this nation. But think about what else was going on in the 40s and 50s. A lot of liberal scholarship is coming on and calling into question the veracity and the truthfulness of God's word. That it's been changed. That it's been manipulated. That it's all fake. That those, those documents aren't really that old. That, that something has happened to them. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this controversy, in the midst of all these people rising up and saying the Bible is not true, the Dead Sea Scrolls show up. Waiting. 
for 2,000 years with just the right moment, and all of a sudden they come up, and, all, and scholars had to say, like, whoa, I guess maybe God did. No yeah, it wasn't by chance. It wasn't by chance. You see that God was working in this. I don't think this is an accident. Why? I mean, you think about it. People have been wandering. At least some of those Bedouin kids have been probably wandering those caves and those areas for over a thousand years. And you're telling me nobody found that? Of all the caves that were over there, nobody stepped in there. Nobody walked there. Oh, look, look what's over there. Nobody found it for 2,000 years. That feels awful strange. It feels awful too strange. I have too much faith to believe that. That nobody just happened to walk in there. Of course God did that. God did it just the right time they discovered. And it shows and demonstrates the faithfulness of God's word. They can compare scrolls a thousand years apart and see how similar they are. It's very different from other books. In fact, if you ever want to look into the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they also make comparisons between that, some of the older versions and the newer versions. Lots of changes. Lots of things have been manipulated and changed and altered. It's it's a very different uh, situation. But what about the details of God's word? What about the details of God's word? Not just not that just God has kept His word. But what about the details? Because again, we understand the Bible is not a history book. The Bible is not a science book. But we expect it to be accurate about those things as well, right? We we need it to be accurate about those things. Sure, it tells us about God. That's great. But if it tells me about God, but it's wrong about science and it's wrong about the world around me, can I trust it? So, one of those details, and there's plenty of others that we could fit in that uh, realm is, for instance, there were a lot of questions concerning uh, the pilot, Pontius Pilate. There wasn't really a great record of him. He's mentioned, I think, to Josephus. He's mentioned a few other places, but it's all significantly after the fact. Because Josephus has been influenced by the Jews and the Bible and other things, or in, in the biblical account, but not necessarily fact, possible. So what about that? And so people were calling the question Pontius Pilate, and the fact that he wanted to go by prefect and not anything else. So what happens? Uh, well, 1961 happened, and you have this stone known as the pilot stone that was discovered. It was, a, it was actually uh, rubble in the sense of whatever it hit, whatever building or, or uh, concept that was actually a part of it had been knocked down, and it had actually been used for fill. They found it supporting a, st a, stair a step in a staircase. And somewhere along the line, they started looking around. I don't know if they finally swept after a long time or whatever. And they, hey, look, there's something written on it. And I apologize, you probably can't read it very well. It's very broken. But right kind of halfway through and in this upper corner, there is an inscription. And I'm guessing your Greek is a little rough, so I'll translate for you. You're welcome. It says, to the divine Augusti Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has dedicated this. And it confirms actually a lot of things in that little statement. This, it confirms that he was, in fact, Pilate, in fact, was a prefect of Judea, as well that he had, had that position at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Very important. Time frame matters. There's also a small copper ring that was later found bearing his name as well. I didn't have all the other information on it, but there was a secondary artifact that was also discovered after the fact at some point in time. But what you see is, again, the Bible makes these claims and it makes these statements. And sometimes archaeologists and sometimes historians, other people come along and say, well, that can't be true. We can't prove it. The Bible's fake. It's false. It's made up. It's just people put stuff together and just put it together. Or it was written so long after the fact, they get their details wrong. What does this prove? That the people that were writing it had lived it. That they had been there. That they knew what they were talking about. And all of a sudden, archaeology brings up these proofs, and it keeps digging things up. In fact, I found this funny quote when I was looking for some of these other details. And it says this, It has been said of Israel, every time a shovel goes into the ground, another skeptic is buried. I thought, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But what, what happens over and over and over again? They're going through, archaeology goes through there, and rather than digging up things that call into question the biblical account, it goes the other way and simply supports it. Now, are we looking for proofs? Does that prove the Bible? No. But it affirms what the Bible is saying. It gives us a greater confidence in the Word of God. And what we see it saying and to us is like, we don't have to look at that as like, I know it makes the claim, but, you know, just ignore that part. Because we have all this archaeology and other things that are telling us something different. We don't find that. In fact, what we do find is a lot of people making uh, uh, historical claims and scientific claims and other things like that and saying, look, see, the Bible's wrong here. And then all of a sudden they make a discovery and like, they have to eat their words. Yeah. Or, as it says in here, every time a shovel goes into the ground, 
another skeptic is buried over and over and over again. Archaeology keeps bringing to light more and more historical details that just simply confirm the biblical account. So when we do this, the Bible does, I mean, faith in a sense is blind, but at the same time, we're not necessarily exercising a blind faith. Does it make sense? We're not exercising necessarily a blind faith that we have the word of God itself, that it testifies to itself, and we see it proving day in and day out. We see that. We understand that. We know that. It has made what the Western society what it is, and yet at the same time, we also see from outside of us in archaeology and science, that they keep bringing things up and saying, look, it supports the word of God. It supports the word of God. It's just as the Bible said. That we can have a confidence in this. And I want you to walk away from this with a confidence in the Word of God. It's so important to me that you have a confidence in God, that you walk out of here and you're like, I know I have the Word of God that is attested to in, in, in history with all these manuscripts, all this thing, because they're not, they're not changing words and calling things into question. It's, it's so that we have it, that I can build my life on it. It's a reason why the, the West is, is the way that it is, why it has values of humanity the way that it does, the, why, the reason why we are generous the way we are. It's not because someone used it to manipulate you. Because this is what God has called us to, to build your life on. There's a reason why it's changed the world. So what do we do with all of this? I think it's very important you walk away from here today and understand the Bible holds up to scrutiny. I don't know if you're questioning that. I understand that sometimes you're doing that. Sometimes teens question with scrutiny. Ah, is it really the word of God? Should I really do this? Is it really true? I can understand that. But you should know that it is true, and it's been proven over and over and over again. You might question a word or two or a comma or two here and there. But we don't have to question doctrine. We don't have to question its claims or its people or God. When the Bible tells us about Jesus, when it tells us about creation, when it tells us about sin, when it tells us about salvation, we know that those things are actually what God wants us to know, that those are things that God wrote, that he put in there for a reason. The Bible, you have to understand, it's either true or it's not. You can't go into some kind of a Goldilocks, kind of a little bit of this and not that, and, and, and slice and dice and do those kinds of things. You'll tear the Bible apart and have nothing. The Bible is either all true or it's not. You understand that? And you're like, how, how important that is that you understand that you buy into that idea? Many have tried to tear this apart, but has made converts out of many of them. Perhaps maybe one of the more famous in, in recent memory is, is Lee Strobel, if you're familiar with him or not. He came to Christ. He was an a, a investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune when his wife found Christ. And he's looking at this as an avowed atheist that there's no way this is true. And he looked at the claims of the Bible, and the one he got stuck on the most was the resurrection of Christ. Which, to be fair, would be an easy one to get stuck on. Why? Because the dead don't rise. He looked at it for two years, investigating. And, you know, when you work with the papers like that, you have connections, you know people, and you can get to people that normal people can't talk to. After two years, he was convinced. And he's been an apologist ever since, defending the very word of God, the very thing he used to at one time question. The Bible made a convert out of a questioner. And it's done it many times. And so when we read in Psalm 119, 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens, we can unashamedly, sh unashamedly say, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we do thank you for this day and that we have your word as it stands before us. That we can go from this place in confidence knowing that we really do have your word. That it is attested over and over and over again in ways that no other ancient book or biography could even come close to. And yet for all the confidence that we can and should have in it, I do wonder how, why then, Lord, do we spend so little time in it? Lord, I pray that you would help us to run our lives based on your word. Looking up and following after you. Lord, if these truly are the words of life, as the disciples came to that conclusion, and then we have these, why do we not enjoy them? Why do we not spend more time with them? But to appreciate what we have and how hard people have worked, and, and really your, your um, 
faithfulness and preserving your word. And when we read passages like that and we see exactly the way in which your word has been preserved, it is truly remarkable that you are a God of your word. And as such, you are trustworthy. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be people of the book that you have preserved, that we would build our lives on this, that we would leave this place with confidence over what it is that you have given to us. And that we might seek to not only glorify your name with it, but share it with others that they also might know you as we know you. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.